have Miha to talk about. The first, well, you probably can see that on the screen. I'm not going to bother wasting time and holding you up, so go ahead. Um, you're already worked up. All right. Thank you. After this awesome introduction from Shani, uh, I can tell you what this talk will be about. About how to build your first computer from kind of very, very low level elements. So I would say we'll start with the outline about the, the digital circuits, uh, the organization of the computer, the features that we may want to include or not want to include, and then the guide will follow. So first, we can st start with very low-level components. These uh, nice colorful diagrams are actually showing NOT gates, NAND gates, NOR gates uh, in a schema that, that there are different masks there. So this is actually at the level of below micrometer. <laughs> so you basically set the different masks, and then you have the different layers of the, of the uh, chip being present on or absent, and depending on that, that conducts or, or doesn't conduct the electricity. And then it allows you to, d depending on the signals on the input, to have or not to have the signal on the input. Next to it is the transistor level design uh, or gate level design. So obviously this, I mean, I, I didn't mean this picture to actually look as obscure as the topic is. Eh? but it looks quite obscure. So we go a little bit higher. So we can think about logic within the computer to be composed of so-called uh, netlist or, or the network where we have some inputs, basically give, or no, uh, give the uh, electric signal or discharge the signal on the wire. And then these inputs, in this case, each of the numbers is actually the 32-bit number, so A and B is 32 bits, 32 wires each, and C is also 32 bits, 32 wires. They go in some black box component that we can realize later on, and give the output, it's either multiplication or addition. So nowadays the we have nice compilers that basically take this level of the uh, description and generate either uh, the uh, silicon uh, description or allow us to upload this network to the FPGA. We can also, oh, this is an FPGA. Uh, this is basically a small board. The price is now vary between 15 or $200. I think I found something for $5, but it's not, not very big. So probably would not fit the computer and entire computer on it. But this one on the left is like from 12 gigs at $60 with all the inputs and outputs. And it can be actually quite capable. It has the VGA output. It has PS2 for mouse or for keyboard. Also, it has RS uh, slots for mouse or keyboards in a different standard. And they are all programmable, as I said, in this uh, hardware description languages like Verilog, VHDL, uh, Clash that I personally use. It's basically a variant of Haskell. My HDL, if somebody likes Python or already knows Python, he doesn't or she doesn't know any other languages. Every major language nowadays has basically a variant that serves hardware description. So that is not a problem. And it's usually at this level. So we say that we multiply two numbers, we add two other numbers, and then we generate the net list. So the secret is the uh, computers that we have as our laptops are possibly a little bit too complex to do it over the weekend. Yeah? So we do something a little bit simpler. So there are many reasons why they are complex. Basically, there, are, there, are f there is a big effort of optimizing every single part of this computer. Also, they, there, there is a huge reward for somebody to, to make it even cheaper and cheaper. But most of them we can avoid if we have 
kind of computer for the common use that is not trying to push up the speed or, or limits, basically, of computing. So, in particular, we, we disregard totally uh, the buffering of memory or cache memories, which have huge impact on performance in nowadays computers, but are very complex to, to design. We have only minimal peripheral devices, minimal mm, output, uh, input and output devices, but they will be arranged in the same way as a normal computer. And we can add it any new features that we wish to be added, as long as we add them piece by piece. So there is no, no problem with expanding this with, say, later on, cache memory. The, the, the basic framework of the project will stay the same. It's just that between memory and CPU, we will have an additional component. And the basic components that we mm, will describe today are basically here. So first we have the, on the bottom, we have the CPU. Actually, I will take this because I don't know if we have a laser, but I didn't bring my own laser. No, no, I don't have les laser no, eyes yet. No. <laughs> so first we have CPU. Oh, you have laser. <laughs> or laser eyes maybe. Uh -huh. Awesome. So CPU, which basically allows us to control the whole computer in a very flexible way. It uses the working memory that is usually implemented within FPGA, at least part of it, because there, there are special blocks for this. We can also use a lot of unused blocks in FPGA as memory, as additional memory. And here we have so-called the I.O. mapping that basically makes the CPU uh, see most of, of the input and output devices as places in memory. So any, any processor like Intel processor does actually most of the time the same. If, if somebody tells me that there are in and out commands, yes, they are, but nobody uses them anymore for most applications, especially not for GPU because that there are too few of them. So most processors actually see the any input as basically a register that gets filled in memory, then reads the data from memory and output that as a register that is written as a normal memory location. That's the that's single critical part about uh, input-output. Then for the input-output, um, we can start with very simple things. First is GPIO. This is a simple register that tells whether we have the signal or a lack of signal on a given pin on the output. Yeah? So that's the simple, simplest kind of uh, input-output. And actually, you can write a program that does simple the control simple peripheral devices using just GPIO. Yeah. That's not very efficient, and if you want something faster or more capable, then we move to something else. So basically, the, the second type of peripherals is that you write kind of an image into a set more, more of memory locations. The simplest example is so-called frame buffer, which is uh, basically an image for entire screen, like you see the screen here. This entire image is in a frame buffer on this Mac computer. And processor doesn't send every pixel to the screen one at a time. Yeah? There is a special device that basically picks one by one pixels and generates the signal in VGA standard or in our case, there is HDMI standard, ob about which we can talk later, but it's actually very similar. It's just digital version of VGA. So we write the image of what is to be transmitted to memory. We, we call it al also, instead of frame buffer, just uh, input-output buffer. Yeah, And then there is a small part of the chip that pushes it through the link. 
And that's how actually most of our keyboards, our mice work, except that instead of whole frame buffer, we have very small buffers like 8 characters, 16 characters, very, very small. And that's usually using the technology so called universal asynchronous receiver, receiver transmitter, which is basically a serial link. So we serialize bytes or words bit by bit. We transmit a sequence, usually a word or a byte, together, and then we stop transmission by setting the link into stable, usually one signal. And then we, when we want to start another transmission, then we will start with zero bit and send them one by one. I will talk about the details in a minute. The, the basic idea is that we have a register for every input-output device that are mapped into memory that are bigger or smaller depending of how complex and how much you need to push on the output or on the input. Network cards actually work in a very similar way, so we also have serial transmission, we also have buffers. So all the pr principles apply. And in here, to introduce the CPU or the processor basically consists of working register file. There are registers that are used for ongoing arithmetic operations. It's basically state of the processor. Arithmetic logic unit, the unit that takes two registers usually. In newer uh, processors we have multiple arithmetic logic units that work in concert but they have the same principle. They are just replicated and usually use, it, use the same command. So arithmetic logic unit takes two inputs from the registers and generate one output. And depending on the command, it's either a logical uh, AND or logical OR or addition or multiplication of two numbers. Then the second the third critical component is the instruction decoder. So we basically read the memory location from the program code and send both the instructions to arithmetic logic unit and also so-called uh, the control instructions or the, the, the register transfer instructions that tell which registers will go where. So for example, if we add two numbers, then we first uh, send the command add to the arithmetic logic unit. And, but at the same time, we send commands to release the input registers from the register file to left and right input of the arithmetic logic unit. And the stack is the simplest way of keeping more registers together for ongoing operations when we finish, for example, addition, we put them on the stack waiting until there will be the, the information, the result will be needed again. The next thing is working memory, which we, in the case of FPGA, we can basically preload with the program and data that we want. So we don't need to have a special ROM code. We just preload together the description of the processor or the computer and the program, yeah? And we have separate banks in I.O. memory. They are basically usually distinguished by higher bits of the address in the simple computers if we don't have memory management. And in here we will avoid memory management. I will tell you why later. And for input-output devices, we will only communicate with them through registers. We will not have a very, uh, very common feature in all uh, modern computers that are interrupts. They are not very difficult to implement, but they are a little bit more complex than, than just writing to memory and waiting for the commands to be ex executed. This is because that means that you need to make the CPU a little bit more complex to automatically save its state whenever it receives interrupts and jump somewhere else. 
But interrupts are only the efficiency optimization. So they are, unless you are using uh, the computer for multitasking, probably you can get away without. And actually, many of the inputs, outputs, uh, uh, devices do not use that many interrupts, or, or not, not at all. And also, we will use the, the feature called dual port memory to avoid so-called stalls. So sometimes certain memories or certain devices in the computers have the access time that is well beyond single cycle of the processor. So they take arbitrarily long, like 100 cycles. And then basically you need to add one more input to your processor that whenever it demands particular address, either writes to it or reads to it, the device that accepts it's either memory or uh, input-output device. The device that accepts this request can say, yeah, but in a moment, like in 100 cycles, yeah? So that means that the device has to prepare for the action. After the stall is uh, asserted, basically the processor stops and waits until the device says, oh, we don't stall you anymore, yeah? You can go on. And why we omit this feature? So basically, uh, external memory can uh, also induce stall. So that would be more complex. Also, virtual memory management, that's a common feature of, of modern computers, is very useful, but uh, it usually is at least as complex to implement and as microprocessor itself. So at least simple one, without cache without branch prediction and few other toys that make it much, much faster. Uh, for the I.O., <coughs> we, we need to take care that basically the processor state is saved. If we have both interrupts and stalls, that starts being a little bit more complex. And, uh, of course, most of the devices that we use <coughs> do not use directly UART. They use something like USB, which is visible for us uh, as, as users of the machine, as serial ports or, or memory devices. But they have underneath quite complex protocol that you need to follow. And there is basically a small microcontroller that makes sure that all the phases of USB protocol are and enumeration are kept in order. So that, that would be implementing just USB is about as complex exercise as building your own computer. And the other feature of all modern computers and also most of the FPGA projects that grow a bit larger is the standard bus. So basically, instead of telling that we write to memory, we have address bus, we have data bus, we say that w whether we write or, or read. We have a standard way of connecting these pins. We add also standard usually interrupt pins, standard stall pins, and few other things like arbitrage that makes sure that if there are many devices that want to write or read something from memory, they will get the access in order. Yeah, That's essential because most of the modern computers actually have many devices that can write or read from memory. And they are usually very greedy about the success. So say the disk, when it has some data, it, it will dump like few megabytes. And in this time, the processor would suddenly stop working, which is very bad user experience. And there are a few standards for this. So if you ever implement one, I would recommend to use either Wishbone, which is open source, AMBA, or Avala. They are not much, much more difficult than implementing just uh, the memory access to everything, but you need to follow the standard that, that makes the whole project cognitively more difficult. The, the features that are very easy to add here is floating point instructions to do floating point operations. 
and the new I.O. course. So basically, if you have this framework, you can basically say, these are the registers for my peripheral device. Like, I don't know, if it's, for example, a radio V device, it will probably have a register for current band, current frequency, and possibly some filters, yeah, or gain. Then you basically write to these registers, and then you r read from the buffer whatever was received in the last second, yeah? Then you can have a ring buffer that basically overwrites whatever was received every second. That's how it's usually organized. Modulo interrupts to make it more efficient for, for the processor to wait for it. So this is a basic sketch as described before. And there are two elements of the interface of such a device. The first is software interface, which so far we have avoided because hardware interface, we have some kind of bus inside, some kind of memory bus in here. Here it's implicit. It can be also standardized. But software interface is something that we also need to take care. So whenever we write such a project, it's good to first document the memory map, under which address where which register is. <coughs> the second is that how these registers and input and output registers react to various changes, what are interactions between them. And uh, the final thing is that whatever processor we implement, it's good to have the instruction set documented somewhere. Of course, the instruction set is usually shown after we show the processor itself. So basically, the idea, the processor here I, I present is very similar to J1. So I use the, this, the, the description of J1 processor to show how it works. So basically, we have this decoding <coughs> part. J1 is basically a fourth processor that is also implemented in FPGA. Uh, that uh, is usually programmed using Forth or Assembler. And it's used for Game Duino project. So it's at least fast enough to, at 50 megahertz, to control all the sprites and nice graphics. It's also very simple, which has advantage. So we have <laughs> the reference here. And the, the way it basically works is that it has two RAM data ports. First, it reads the instruction. It decodes it. Then this decoded instruction, first, it, it points which registers we use. It's usually top of the stack and then second on the stack. We put into it into arithmetic logic unit. And then we compute either addition or the logical end or logical or. And then we have this result. And this result has few choices. Either it goes to part of the stack. So it's either on top, uh, usually put on top of the stack. Sometime as the second if we duplicate the result. And it can also go to be, uh, to be written in memory, if you want to write to memory. So it's very simple organization, basically. After each iteration, we incre increment the program counter by one. And we also can uh, have the separate return stack of addresses here. That is basically used for making sure that we don't mix our da data and return addresses. So most processors today actually have only one stack. But the problem with this uh, situation is that it's kind of more difficult to debug, as proven by so many stack overflow problems. So basically, whenever something breaks on the stack, you can do everything with the machine that you don't want. Yeah. And that also means that that's a typical problem. Usually debugging problems also exhibit themselves as security vulnerabilities. That's not very uncommon. And instruction set architecture can be very simple. So we basically would assign the binary number 
to each of these commands. So we have if that takes the top of the stack, checks if it's zero. If it's zero, then it jumps to another address. Yeah? So we don't just increment program counter, we load it from the address. Then we can call the address and put the current address on the plus one on the return stack. And we can re return from the procedure. That's usually sufficient to implement most of the control constructs. The only thing missing here that you can add is in the direct jump. The second thing is that for the stack management and memory management, we do just want load and store instructions. They look the same. You have memory address or computed memory address and you have the contents on the stack. You can have either pop or slide instructions. So basically pop just forgets top end elements on the start stack some people prefer to use slide instructions where you take the top few ele n elements of the stack and just discard all the elements below them. So you take two top elements and you discard the next 10. That's because it's very convenient to implement the return of arguments from the subroutine this way. So basically you don't need to manage the, the fact that you had a lot of data passed to you when the routine was called, you just generate the result on the top of the stack and then do you discard the arguments. And you can also pick nth element from the stack. That's an indirect as access. Also, we frequently use the, the second way of indirect access, which is RI indexing. In this case, it's not necessary for the basic demonstration. And the arithmetic logic, usually the most important ones are first we need to load a constant. So whenever the top bit is one of the command, then we treat the rest of the command as a constant and basically load it into the top of the stack. Then we can have a logical operation like AND, OR, and OR. That's usually sufficient because if we load a constant that is all ones and we use ZOR, then we have automatically negation, for example. There are some people that prefer in minimal computers to use, for example, not AND and not XOR, but that's really variation on the topic. And of course, basic arithmetic, so like addition, sub subtraction, multiplication. Uh, if you add division, that starts to be expensive to synthesize. So unless you really need division, you don't add it, yeah? Of course, all these uh, small boards for 60 things nowadays actually allow you to, to easily have so many divisions as you want for the microprocessor. But uh, if you want also to add some complex uh, peripherals on board, you may want to avoid division. It's also the slowest instruction usually. So it may not, it, it may take quite a long time to, to, be, to be executed. That means that the, the clock of the whole processor, because normally processors work, work with uh, cycles of equal length, will be slower. Yeah? Unless we introduce stall and use it only for division. Now, after we have a CPU, we know how it works what is its instruction set, then we can also tell, uh, I think this image is slightly too small, oh, well. how the uh, visual video signal is synthesized. So basically we have this frame buffer that stores all the pixels. And we can see that uh, on the VGA connector actually there are three important signals and two sy synchronizing control signals. The three signals are analog. This is red, green, and uh, blue signal. And it's basically the voltage up to, I think, 1.2 volts. And the horizontal synchronization and vertical synchronization show us that on such an image, there is end of line, 
that's horizontal uh, synchronization, and then end of the screen, which is vertical synchronization. So basically, we go one by one with pixels. We generate the signal for these pixels. When the line ends, we generate horizontal sync. And then we do nothing. We don't give any output for the duration of so-called uh, end of frame <coughs> or front porch and back porch or margins. So ba basically, we send the dat data for each pixel. Then we have a margin. And during this margin, we just trigger the signal that it's, it's over with this line. And then when we generate all the lines, we also have the lower margin, so-called also vertical blank, when we don't send any data for so many lines, and at some point we say it's end of screen. And to make it work, there is basically so-called VESA consortium that uh, generated the standards and the standards are uh, very easy to read. So basically, there is a frequency of the pixel clock in megahertz. So we need to generate a new pixel data if we are within the screen at this frequency with small error below 1%. Then, this is the vert uh, horizontal resolution. This is vertical resolution of the screen. So this is most commonly used low resolution mode then these are all the pixel clocks per one line. So after we have uh, pixels that we send, we have also pixel clock slots when we have a margin. The same applies to lines. So we have so many lines visible, 480, and we have more lines as slots. So we have line slots. And then two middle numbers here for the lines and here for the pixels are basically when the synchronization starts, when we have to tell at which clock we have to tell that it's end of line. And then when the synchronization ends. So this is start and this is end of synchronization. And the same for lines. As you see, it's basically a very, very simple machine that goes along all the pixels plus some people pixels that we don't have in frame buffer memory that are just filler between lines and between screens. Because when we end the screen, we automatically go back to the previous screen. And that means that basically, even after one screen, the electronics in the uh, output device gets synchronized and it can follow on with the display depending on how this electronics works, because for the old style cathode, the right tube, it was basically that the, it was moving so and so fast along the screen, and this clock frequency basically served to space the, the signal, to insert the signal at the right moment when it moves through the screen. Now we have LCD that just knows that, oh, the data ended, yeah? It's probably this frequency. So it estimates the frequency, and then it stores the whole frame and shows it. The HDMI and display port basically do the same, but with digital data. So instead of three slots here, RGB, you have the serial links that say send either eight bit Per, per per pixel or 24 bit per pixel, depending on the color range and so on. Also, you have some kind of initial negotiation, just like with USB, about what actually is the data rate and frequency. It makes it, of course, a little bit more complex. The also, like implementing the full HDMI interface or display port is a little bit like implementing a small computer, because you need to you know, you need to boot it, you need to start it, you need to agree on the resolution, on data rate, you need to check whether there is uh, audio link in the background and so on. Okay, so that's pretty easy actually to write. If you were to write a Python program, or Haskell program, or your favorite Ruby program to do it, you could probably do it. The only problem is that it has to execute at same maybe frequency of 
50, or in th this case, 54 megahertz, or in this case, 74.25 uh, megahertz. You can still write the Python program that does it, but it has to be in my HDL to be synthesized as FPGA gate description, basically. So the main difference here is speed. And here is actually uh, an example of a little bit more advanced VGA controller that not only keeps the frame buffer but also knows the character codes. And it's, uh, it's made by my colleague who makes it to resurrect his favorite computer of all days, which is Pet Commodore. And the last peripheral that we want to take care about is serial port, because basically this is how we communicate with mice with keyboards. So there is a little bit of layer of protocol over it, but it can be implemented in microprocessor, say. And that's also very simple. So we agree on predefined clock that we use to communicate on the link. Okay. So I will hurry. And then we start with the zero bit. So we, we, we have one when we don't communicate anything, but then we stand with the zero bit. That's obligatory. Then we se send this eight bits, possibly a parity. That's optional. And when we stop, we set one. So basically, as long as we have the same clock, it will be detected on the other side. If we want to send and receive data, that we basically need two wires. We also need probably common reference frame for the uh, voltage, but that's usually taken care about on the electrical level. And clock precision should be, uh, variation should be below 5%. The most common frequencies are here. So if you just know the frequency, it's pretty easy to, to do it. You can actually do it at low frequency uh, with a normal computer. You don't need FPGA. And the, this would be the end. So I could just show you the code and play with it. But now the, the last final step, that is not to be left as an exercise for a student, is to write software for it. So one could do some work to basically make the software that we already have compile on this machine. This is actually not that difficult. We have LLVM, we have few other techniques to retarget existing compiler. That's probably the easiest way. And of course, the next, my next tar target is to publish it uh, as a series of blog source, which basically B blog uh, uh, posts, which basically means that I need to comment it very carefully so everything is apparent what happens behind the code. And of course, support standard bus, then we can download a lot of devices from open cores, say, and just put them into our memory <coughs> and use them. Yes? Well, one question. Data abstract rather than getting the source code, but expressed in Clash, how large is this thing? To, to build the so it, it, it's still no, not entirely finished, but in a way it's very, very small. So, so for, for example, I, I downloaded the Modeline database from Xorg to be able to support many different resolutions and just Modeline database. So every, the video controller with Modeline database is 150 lines. I mean, the, the, the total clash source for the big machine in order magnitude, 1,000? It should be mm, below 1,000. Wow. So you it's... Lines, lines of code? Lines of code. Yes. Sub, 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 sub it's one. well below 1,000, yeah. Okay. J1 is itself is, I think, 200. Another um, alternative uh, solution is the project of Berlin. It's 2000. But this is long uh, without peripherals because they have more peripherals, ba basically. But you, you can do it as a small project, say three months, six months. If you don't know anything about FPGA, that's doable. Of course, if you add more and more peripherals and you add cache, because cache probably would like double the code size, 
because it's rather rather complex to infer how it should be cached. Yeah, th there, are, there th this is the trade-off of how to make it minimal. I, I hope I could get it below 500, but I'm not guaranteeing anything. Uh, it's not yet final count. Uh, so th this is a, a general purpose computer? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you see uh, most people who would, uh, obviously uh, m most people who are involved in these types of projects are doing it as a hobby, or just a pastime, but do you think the, the practical applications are for uh, uh, specialist computers doing a, a single uh, task? Yes, and the simplest example of the uh, products that are already present on the market, besides the game Duino, which basically uses the separate computer just to synthesize the image. There is also another one. Basically, it's uh, J1 for controlling the peripheral, the network device. That's, that's what J1 was uh, originally uh, made for. The other one is Arduino Shifty. So people basically re-implemented the Arduino instruction set, put it on F FPGA and added a lot of fancy peripherals. So you can have any number of analog inputs, any number of analog outputs, and you have many more pins <coughs> in approximately the same format, slightly more uh, power use. So for any kind of project where you have maybe more complex peripherals, or you need faster peripherals or higher performance on peripherals, that would be probably the way to go. So to you, you can use the CPU as basically control for, for the peripheral in this case. All right, I'm afraid we don't have time for more questions.